Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is John Woodrow Cox. John is a staff writer at the Washington Post, and today we will be speaking about his book, Children Under Fire, an American Crisis. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So, John, I'm full of questions, but I I have to tell you the first thing that hit me in the face is the statistics that you brought bring that over the 10 years or the past 10 years, 30,000 kids have been killed. This is freaking crazy. I know, I know. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So before we get there, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background. You you work for the Washington Post. Uh, Have you always been a journalist or, or have you had other professions before becoming a journalist? Uh, so I've I've been a journalist since college. So pretty much my entire uh, you know professional career I've spent in journalism. Uh, I've been at the Post for the past uh, seven years. I, I came to the Post in 2014, um, and since 2017 I've written uh, mostly about uh, gun violence and the way that gun violence impacts uh, children in America. Um, how does it feel to be? A journalist being at the edge of the latest things happening, uh, I don't know, around your town, around politics, mm-hmm. around whatever, what kind of journalism or what's your topic of expertise other than, I mean, other than gun violence? And, and yes, can you tell us about the adrenaline day or the boring days that you go through? I mean, you know, these days, there's not that many boring days, I think. You know, there's so, the last, uh, you know, 18 months, really, two years have been, well, I guess really since, uh, you could almost say since the the, the Trump administration came into power, it doesn't feel like there's been many uh, boring moments uh, since that was, I guess, 2016. So, um, uh, you know, the pandemic has made it uh, harder, obviously, to do the job. you know, especially last year before people started to get, you know, vaccinated. Um, I did quite a bit of reporting still out in the field, uh, you know, knowing that I might, I might get COVID. Uh, but, you know, mostly what I've written about for the past, uh, I don't know, five or six years is, is uh, childhood trauma, you know, the way that children are affected by trauma in different ways. I wrote last year about uh, the pandemic, you know, how COVID was impacting the lives of kids in this country and you know, this year I'm back to gun violence. And, and of course, the book is uh, all about uh, gun violence. But, you know, not, not too many boring days. I, I, uh, I stay pretty, pretty busy and uh, stimulated. <laughs> and you got attracted towards the subject of gun violence, either because something happened that you said I had to write this, or is there a more personal anecdote? Well, you know, in this country, um, gun violence is just always a presence, you know, it's just always there. And, you know, the, the gun culture in America is just everywhere. I mean, there's more guns in this country than there are people, you know, there are over 400 million guns in America. And, um, and so it's a part of your life. I mean, if you, if you sort of are born here, you grew up here, uh, you know, there's just guns around, you know, and, and uh, back in, um, I don't know, five or six years ago, my my editor at the Washington Post had the idea that maybe I should explore a project about uh, kids and violence, just in general, not just gun violence, but kids and violence. But then, you know, very quickly, as I started to meet children who'd who'd been through these events, uh, very quickly it became clear that it needed to just be about uh, kids and gun violence, and specifically how the way that, that gun violence impacts their lives. And you know, I was drawn to this really because of the first kid that I met. Uh, this was in early 2017, and um, I met a little boy in Washington, D.C., whose father had been uh, shot to death in the middle of the day, um, and it was less than a block from where this, this boy went to school. His name is Tyshawn McFadder. He's actually, you know, one of the two main subjects of the book. And, you know, when I met him, and I wrote his story. And then when I met um, the kids in South Carolina, these kids in South Carolina who had gone through a school shooting, it just became clear to me that uh, America did not understand what this was really doing to their children. Like the, the people 
we, we tend in this country, especially we tend to only look at the kids who die, right? That's like the headlines are how many people die, how many people get shot. But I kept finding children who had not been shot, who were still alive, but whose lives had been destroyed by gun violence. So I, I think when I discovered that and I started to meet these kids and, and to see how much their lives had been devastated, that I just knew I had to, to keep at it. I just had to do more. So uh, that was really the moment, I think, when I realized that I wanted to write a book that I, and that I just needed, needed uh, to say more about what was going on. Right. Okay. So uh, what makes the United States so special? I mean, I live in Canada. The border, the border right now in Montreal to New York is just 30 minutes. So in right. 30 minutes, I could be uh, in the United States. We have more or less the same demographics. We, we, having arm, firearms here is legal, yet we don't have this love affair with arms. I mean, some people use them for what they are supposed to be used for, which is hunting, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm a vegan, so I'm even against that. But, uh, but I mean, people you have their guns, their rifles, whatever. They don't get AK-47s. They don't get uh, super machine guns. Uh, right. uh, but it's basically the same demographics. People are allowed to have guns here as they are allowed to have guns in the States why in the States did people adore the gun as if it was an alternative God? Well, I think that um, America has a, a, a long love affair, certainly with guns. I think the fact that uh, they are enshrined in our constitution, uh, you know, I think the Second Amendment certainly um, is a part of that. Although, you know, when the Second Amendment was written, uh, the founding fathers had muskets, you know, that took a uh, long time to load, you know, there was no, uh, the idea of a mass shooting was, um, didn't exist, you know, that, that, that was not something that was possible with those firearms. Now we have, you know, children uh, who are getting AK-47s and shooting at police with them. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it's just a deep part of American culture. And I think that also, uh, you know, we, we have more guns per capita than, you know, any other developed nation in the world. And we have laws that do a very poor job at regulating them. You know, Americans are not more evil than people anywhere else. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's no statistics that bear that out. Because when we look at other types of crime, uh, American crime is very much consistent with other countries, other developed countries. Where, where we are totally different is on the subject of guns, you know, and... Uh, it, it's a disease. I mean, that's really the way to describe it. It's a public health crisis and it's a disease in this country. Wow. One of the statistics that also caught my attention is that you said that on average, one child is shot every hour. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a, so can you tell us what is the traumatic effect that a child suffer after surviving seeing their best friend being shot or mm -hmm. seeing their father being shot or, or or having seen being witness to a mass shooting uh, right. even if they are not their friends but they are right there watching it and being having their own life in danger right so you know one of the uh, little girls in the book uh, one of the two main subjects is a little girl named Ava Olson and uh, she was on a playground uh, one day in 2016. Uh, this was in South Carolina. She was a first grader and she had just walked outside for recess. You know, she had her cupcake with her when a 14-year-old uh, a boy pulled up uh, in a pickup truck and he opened fire on, the, uh, on this playground. And, you know, that entire shooting only lasted 12 seconds uh, from when it began to when it ended because his gun jammed. Wow. And only one child died, you know, so this is why most people have never heard of this shooting. But the kids who were there that day were devastated by it. And, you know, even now, even today, Ava is still dealing with uh, debilitating trauma. You know, she, especially in the early days, she would hurt herself. She'd bang her head against the wall. She pulled out her eyelashes. Uh, she would, you know, dig her nails into her skin. She felt... Uh, an overwhelming sense of guilt because the boy who died uh, was someone who she loved. He was, the, he was, his name was Jacob Paul and he was the smallest boy in first grade. And Ava and some of these other kids felt a real responsibility to protect him. So suddenly they were dealing with guilt. They were dealing with uh, the trauma and the pain and the anger and the fear. 
And, you know, we're now uh, five years after that shooting, and Ava still is dealing with huge amounts of trauma. She, she can't go back to school. Uh, she's on all sorts of medications, antipsychotics and antidepressants, uh, just to deal with something that lasted for 12 seconds. It's still lingering with her. And, and you know, much of the book is, is about her. And then the other little boy who um, Ava has actually befriended is this little boy I mentioned from Southeast DC, uh, Tyshawn McFadden, who, um, you know, the way that he dealt with his father's killing was really through a lot of anger. You know, he was very angry about it. He, he was afraid that the shooter was going to come for him as well. Um, so, you know, these are kids who didn't get shot. They weren't legally victims of anything, but uh, they are undeniably victims of gun violence in this country. There's, there's no debate. I just want to add for the listeners that um, in your um, Twitter feed, you have the whole story of uh, these two characters of your book with real pictures, right. which is when, when a person is reading, I mean, each one of us, make up the image of the person in our imagination right. and then uh, so i was reading the book and then i went to see your twitter feed and then i was able to um compare the right. image that i have put in my imagination with the actual pictures of the kids that you right. are and and it's, it's it's i mean it's very real and palpable and the father of this little kid he looks like an amazing father who was happy to spend time with his kids and play right. video games and do all these things that now this kid is not going to be able to do that anymore right right yeah no that's exactly right i mean you know we especially when parents get killed in this country we often uh, you know, it's often a very short story and we see something like, you know, father of two or mother of three, but you know, that's, those are two or three kids, right. Who are suddenly without a parent. And I know firsthand from reporting on these kids that, you know, the effects of losing a parent to gun violence are so uh, long lasting and, uh, you know, debilitating. And, and there, you know, there are millions of kids in this country who are growing up in communities where there are random acts of gunfire that, you know, then they have to live with that reality and that fear all the time. And, and that has a really debilitating effect on a kid's ability just, just to develop normally, to grow up normally. I wonder how you feel uh, when you hear politicians and one comes to my mind is this woman, Marjorie Green Taylor, who says that all these activists against guns and gun violence, they are just paid actors. Yeah, that's just a lie. I mean, she's just lying. Um, you know, I've spent years now reporting on uh, victims of gun violence. After the Las Vegas uh, mass shooting, I spent a week there with uh, six teenage girls who were out there that day. Two of them had bullet wounds that, you know, I saw with my own eyes. And, um, you know, this idea that activists are paid or that they're actors is just, uh, it's just meant to be a distraction really from the reality. You know, last year was the worst year of gun violence in modern American history. More than 43,000 people died uh, from, from guns last year in this country. And uh, that's the worst uh, since we've really recorded it. That, that's, that's uh, and it's gonna probably be worse this year. So, you know, this idea that we should just keep doing nothing, uh, if we keep doing nothing, the result will be the same. We'll, we'll keep losing 40,000 plus people every single year to gun violence just because we're making a choice to do nothing about it. Well, the politicians say, some of them, of course, that you just have to give more guns to the quote unquote good people so that the good people can shoot the bad people. And of course, it's, it's, it's just, I, I yeah. see you shaking your head. And I agree with you, but I, I, I mean, this is why I continue expanding. And, and not only that, but the laws are being changed in a way that people have more access, not less access, but right. more access to more sophisticated weapons. And so I, I find it frustrating. I, I wonder what's, how you feel about that. Well, you know, what we know statistically is that access to a firearm makes a person uh, much more likely to die uh, in their home. Uh, and if it's a child who has access to that firearm, that number goes up. So, you know, uh, one of the mo most compelling statistics, I think, in the book is that uh, the single best way to predict uh, the suicide rate among youths in a state 
is the proportion of homes in that state that have a gun. It is not, uh, it is not the number of kids who've actually previously attempted suicide. The best predictor is just the percentage of homes that have a gun. And what that tells you is that if there's a gun in a home, and especially if that gun is un unlocked and that child has access to it, the likelihood that they're going to die because of that gun goes up exponentially, you know? Um, and we see this every day. You know, kids get access to guns every day. They shoot themselves, they shoot their parents, they shoot up schools. You know, if, if, if adults in this country just locked up their guns, if that's the only thing that changed in terms of American gun culture, half of the school shootings, more than half, well more than half of the school shootings since Columbine would not have happened. They just wouldn't have happened if adults just locked up their guns. And so if we wanna prevent half the school shootings over the next two decades, it's the same thing. People just have to lock up their guns. It's not even about getting rid of their guns or their guns being heavily regulated or them not being able to, to buy them. It's just that, you know, when you get a gun, you have to be responsible with it. But in many parts of this country, we don't even require adults to do that. Okay, so I, I complain about the politicians who wants to increase the amount of guns in the country. Uh, what are the other politicians doing to help people like Eva and Tashan or to prevent this uh, ep epidemic of gun violence and the spread of gun possessions? Well, you know, at the federal level, uh, not a lot has changed. Uh, and it's, it's because of a quirk in our law that in, in the Senate, it's not enough to only have 50 votes. You know, you actually need to overcome the filibuster. So you need 60 votes to pass um, legislation in the Senate. And because of that, uh, you know, no gun legislation, meaningful gun legislation has passed in many, many years. And, you know, it would be hard to pass right now, frankly. Uh, so most of the progress that we're seeing here is taking place at the state level, uh, where, you know, they're, they're passing legislation like the safe storage laws that, you know, mandate parents lock up their guns, uh, red flag laws that, you know, when somebody maybe is uh, showing signs of suicidal ideation or threatening behavior, they can have their guns temporarily taken away from them. You know, there's laws that have been passed to uh, strip domestic abusers of their guns. So, but all that's really happening at the state level. And it's, it's going to take, uh, you know, Republican senators to either decide that they're going to um, pass the gun legislation that, frankly, most Americans want. You know, there's this big misconception in America that uh, Americans are split 50-50 on the issue of guns. And that's simply not true. Uh, the vast majority of Americans support some form of gun safety legislation. It's just that the people who, uh, who make the decision, the senators, they're the ones who are split. So the division is on Capitol Hill. It's not in America. Wow. Do you know if these kids uh, whose life have been transformed, are they getting some kind of psychological help or psychiatry help or, or how or tools to deal with the drama that they are facing? Yeah, that's really difficult. You know, that's really hard uh, for kids in this country to get that sort of help because it's, it's very expensive. You know, generally, um, you know, they don't have their insurance doesn't cover mental health care. So, you know, often these parents are left on their own wow. to, uh, to get their kids' mental health help, and, and uh, that's very expensive. So, you know, in Tyshawn's case, uh, you know, he very briefly had some therapy when he was in school, but that was about it. And, you know, Ava's parents have gone to, um, you know, at least half a dozen different therapists trying to find somebody who's a good fit for her, but it's, it's really difficult and it's very expensive because, you know, we don't, uh, we don't provide support for, for, those, for those children and those families. Wow. I, I recorded another episode with a journalist. His name is Ian Grillo, and he covers gun violence and gang members. And he told me that a, a person can go and buy 15, 20 AK-47s, no question asked. I mean, not just one, but 15 of them are in one shot. And he or she would not be asked a question like, why do you want 15? Well, yeah, I mean, there are parts of this country where you can get you know, semi-automatic, uh, you know, assault rifles, or even in some cases, fully automatic uh, rifles. 
you know, that's uh, people often say that, uh, you know, cities like Chicago and Washington, D.C. and New York, uh, they want to argue that those places are proof that gun legislation doesn't work because there's still gun violence in those places. But the truth is that America has open borders. You know, our states, you can drive from one state to another. So for, you know, the past 20 years, if you were, let's say, a gang member or a drug, uh, drug dealer in Washington, D.C., and you wanted to go buy a high-powered weapon, all you have to do is drive to Virginia, which has had much weaker gun laws. You could go to a gun show and pick up whatever guns you wanted, uh, often because you can buy guns at those places, often without having your background checked. So, you know, this idea that uh, these cities are somehow proved that gun legislation doesn't work is just a lie. You know, it's just not true. The only way that gun legislation really works is if it's uniform from one state to another. That's the way it works. Wow. Yeah, this is not a six pack that you buy six for the boys at home. <laughs> right. Right. So guns designed to kill as many people yeah. as, as, as possible. Uh, for that kid, the 14 year old kid that did this killing, uh, whatever happened to him or what was his motivation? So his motivation was uh, really to be a famous school shooter. You know, he wanted to kill as many kids as he could. I mean, that was his, uh, he, 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 he researched it constantly online. He, he idolized the uh, Columbine uh, shooters. Uh, and he had uh, told friends, you know, online that he wanted to be, you know, the best school shooter ever. And um, he is now serving a very long uh, sentence, uh, I believe at least 30 years, but you know, he may very well, he was tried as an adult and ended up pleading guilty to the charges. And uh, you know, other than, uh, aside from the little boy, Jacob Hall, who he killed at school, he also killed his father. Uh, he shot another student in the foot and he shot a teacher in the shoulder. They both survived, but um, so yeah, he's, he's gonna be in prison for most, if not all of his life. So in a way, this is also con also contagious. You see it in TV and then you yeah. idolize it and you join some, I don't know, groups on online and then you kind of reinforce and encourage each other to go and do the deed and, and some of them go as far as doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are, uh, there are kids, young people in this country who are obsessed with uh, school shootings, who are obsessed with guns and uh, some of them actually do go through with it. And it's absolutely contagious. We know after these big mass shootings that there tends to be more uh, in the aftermath of that. You know, after the shooting in Las Vegas, we saw an explosion of, of shootings. After the shooting in uh, Parkland in Florida, there were lots of shootings after that. So, you know, it, it is contagious. And, you know, the only way that America is going to overcome this is if we start to treat it like a public health crisis, because that's what it is. We need to treat this like, you know, cancer. We need to treat it like a disease. That's how we need to approach it. And, you know, we need to come up with common sense solutions that will make a difference. You know, America is never going to get from 43,000 dead from guns to zero. That day will never come. But if we got from 43,000 to 25,000 or 20,000, that would be worth it. You know, those are thousands of lives every year and uh, millions of people whose lives are affected in some way. Uh, if, as far as media, media companies, uh, are there any efforts being done in order to know, I don't know, since it's contagious and people see it and then they want to do it because they see it, is there anything that is being done in order to tamper down this, I don't know, glorification of violence? We see it in the TV, we see it in social media, and that's where, that's where kids and other adults get the idea. So I don't know, I'm not saying... Uh, stop reporting on, on this, but is there any way it could be reported differently so it's not being, the killer is not glorified? Well, I think journalists, especially since Columbine, have made a really conscious effort to not glorify shooters and to not provide uh, more detail than is necessary. You know, we have a duty, of course, to report the reality of what happened to try to understand the shooter's motivation and things like that. Um, so, but that's a constant challenge, you know, is, is how much do you decide, you know, I dealt with that with the book is how much was I going to write about the shooter? 
Uh, and I felt like there was a lot to learn from his behavior and the decisions that he made and how he was inspired. So I felt like it was worth doing. You know, I felt like his story was worth telling. But I think journalists need to be really thoughtful, especially in TV. You need to really be thoughtful about, you know, whether you're going to uh, tell the story about that shooter and how much detail you're going to reveal about them. Because we do know that, you know, somebody else might see that and be motivated to go out and do the same thing. Okay, well, there are still many journalists like you who have a conscience, but there are Facebook groups and I don't yeah. know what other kind of, uh, this is not a subject that I follow, so, but I'm sure there right. are groups that, that these people who are fanatic about gun violence, they go and chat and encourage each other. Right. Yeah, and there's not a lot, there's a, not a lot that law enforcement can do about that because most of it's protected under free speech, you know, right. so until somebody says they're going to commit a crime, uh, you know, if they're just sort of talking in fantasy and things like that, which is often what they say they're doing, um, you know, it's hard for, uh, you know, law enforcement to really go after those folks. Well, John, this is a fascinating topic. It sure makes us reflect. Uh, I would encourage the readers to check it out and to follow you also on Twitter. I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and, of course, uh, where can people buy it and if you sure. have a website where they can follow you as well. Yes. Yeah, so the name of the book is Children Under Fire, an American Crisis. And, uh, you know, really anywhere books that are sold, if, if people have a favorite bookstore or Amazon or Barnes and Noble, you know, wherever they want to get it, they can get it. Uh, if they want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at uh, just my name, at John Woodrow Cox. And my, uh, I do have a personal website. It's just johnwoodrowcox.com. So I'm, I'm easy to find. John, thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank you for having me. This was great.